Father, we thank you at this time. We bless your name and glorify you. What a great God you are. We are asking, Lord, that today you will perfect what you have started in every life in Jesus' name. Amen. Speak to everyone. Amen. And what you say, we pray the power to go forth and pursue. Grant to everyone in Jesus' name. Amen. Confirm your word in every life. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. God bless you. You can sit down. Today, we're coming to the final session of our minister's professional conference. And today, we're talking about an enduring heart for his end time harvest. The end time harvest. Peter, James, John, cannot come back and do the harvest of today. This end time. Paul cannot come back and do the harvest and reap the harvest today because they've gone. They've done their work at this end time. You and I are the instruments in the hand of the Lord and we should have the heart, an enduring heart, a purified heart, a powerful heart and a pursuing heart so that we can harvest the end time souls into the kingdom of God. Enduring heart. We're looking at Matthew chapter 24 and we're looking at verse 12. Matthew chapter 24 verse 12. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall what's called. Think about that. The Lord sends us forth that we will remind people that Christ has come. And Christ is the one that saves us from all iniquity. Thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sin. And then as iniquity abounds, instead of us having greater power, and greater zeal and greater passion to go to those people who are having iniquity multiplying and deepening in their lives. The iniquity sets us back. Because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. Look at verse 13. In verse 13, but he that shall endure unto the end. What does that mean? He that shall endure. Does it mean the person that will sit down, iniquity is abounding, he's seen everything, he doesn't have any feeling, he doesn't have any drive, he doesn't have any passion, he's sitting down and he's enduring? No. He's talking about the people that have the gospel and they are preaching the gospel. Although iniquity is abounding, although iniquity is increasing, they endure in the ministry, in the calling that God has given them. They endure in the Lord. They endure in their salvation. They endure in the service that the Lord had given them. Now, if you know the nature of man, those who are not born again, and he's appealing to those who are born again. When iniquity abounds, they cry, they shout, they preach. Iniquity abounds, then they say, what can I do? I preach all the doctrine I know to preach. I preach all the messages I know to preach, and iniquity abounds. They are silenced. They cannot talk anymore. Because the more they preach, the more they pray, and the more they proclaim the word, the more iniquity is abounding. And they do not endure in the ministry. But the Lord said, He that shall endure to the end. What end? Peter came to the time he departed. End. Paul came to the time. He said, the time of my departure is at hand. That's also end. There's also the end of the age. The end of the period of the dispensation in which we're living when the dead shall rise and 
those who are alive will be cut off to meet him in the air. That's the final end for the church. But that's not the end of the world yet because that's the end of the church active and militant and triumphant. After that rapture, there's a great tribulation that will be in all the world. The end has not come yet. And then Christ will come. He'll set up his millennial reign. And eventually after the millennial reign, the end of the world, like we see now, will be over. And then there'll be the everlasting kingdom ever and ever. The end, your own end, my own end, you endure in faith, you endure in love, you endure in hope, you endure in following the Lord until your end. I endure your end is different from my end. My end is different from your end. Peter and Paul did not have their end on the same day. Our end, you consider your own end and you say, everything I've heard, everything I've known, everything I've learned, everything I experienced, I continue on to the end. And then the church of the living God will continue until the end, until the rapture, and then the whole system continues until the final end. Look at verse 14. In verse 14 it says, and this gospel, when Jesus was talking, he was talking about the gospel he preached, the gospel of the kingdom. This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached. Iniquity shall, indeed, shall continue we're going to keep on preaching. There'll be wars and rumors of wars. We keep on preaching that gospel. There'll be betrayal. There'll be those who betray their neighbors, their brothers, fellow ministers. But we don't allow that to jolt us. We keep on preaching the gospel. There'll be the scattering of the Jews and the regathering of the Jews. Whatever is happening, we don't allow that to hinder us. The world will frown at us and the world will persecute us. We don't allow anything to hinder us or stop us and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world in all the world. Now we have technology to help us. Now we also have our own human strength and we go here and there and we keep on preaching that gospel. Don't allow anything, any situation, anything, any circumstance, anything, anything in our country, anything in any nation to stop us. If you look at, you know, the Bible, the Lord Jesus said, there shall be wars. He said so. There shall be. There shall be rumors of wars. He said so. There shall be. And what we're hearing of this happening there, that happening there, that happening there, is not taking God by surprise. It should not take the church by surprise. There will be famine. There will be pestilences. There will be poverty. There will be various situations. Jesus said so. And so we shouldn't concentrate our lives on those things. Jesus said will happen. And then we we'll say because there is pestilence and because there is famine and because there is scarcity and because we don't have enough to eat, we push the gospel aside. No, in the midst of all that and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. Although iniquity is abounding, Although the pressure is so much, yet in all nations there will be a witness and then shall the end come. Give me a good amen. amen. An enduring heart for his end time harvest. We're looking at three things. Number one, number one is possessing end time faith. For end time habits. Number two is preserving enduring love in an enkindled heart. Number three is persevering, enabling hope for an endless 
heaven. Look at number one. Number one is the possession of end time faith for end time harvest. We're looking at Luke chapter 18, verse 8. I tell you that he, God, will avenge them, the saints, speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth? Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth? He didn't say, shall he find men of position, men of power, men of authority. Shall he find titles on the earth? Many people have position, but you know, God is not going to be looking for a position when he comes. Many people have titles, and God is not going to be looking for your title when he comes. When the Son of Man cometh, shall he find activity, religious activities on the earth? Yes, there will be activities, but he will not be looking for that when he comes. He will be looking for one thing, shall he find faith on the earth? What kind of faith? Personal faith. If you're still here, when the Lord comes, or when the Lord comes for you at your own time, and you're about to cross over, shall he find personal faith in your heart? Or shall he find doubt, unbelief? I don't know where I'm going. My life is being relayed back to me. All that I've lived and the way I have done, my life is being played back onto me. And then, what is personal faith? When the Son of Man comes, shall he find personal faith on the earth? Shall he find persevering faith on the earth? A person that says, I believe in the Lord. And now, he doesn't know when the Lord will come for him. Let's say, for example, he becomes sick. Now understand, God heals. But who knows the last sickness that will come before you go home? Abraham, Moses, and all the other people, their end came and they went. And different things to different people home. Maybe as we look at the majority of people, there is, you know, sickness and weakness and all that. And faith is what God is looking for. Whether you are up or down, whether you have this situation, that situation, faith. When the Son of Man comes, when he comes for you, shall he find persevering faith in your heart. Uh, there are people when they are sick like that and you know what they say, I don't know what is happening. I prayed, I've called people to pray. They say and their relatives come can we take you to Baba Saleh? Can we take you to that other man? He rub something on you. Uh, they say well I will repent when I come back. Take me anywhere you want to take me and they take them there and they die in the shine of the devil. When the Son of Man comes, we need to find persevering faith in your heart. We need to understand that faith is very important. And Christ said, when he's coming back, as he comes back, and he comes for you, he comes for me, he wants to find faith in your heart. Number one, personal faith. Number two, persevering faith. Number three, purifying faith. Purifying their hearts by faith. Will you find faith in your heart? Purifying faith in your heart? What kind of faith do you have? The faith that, you know, you keep on sinning and God is gracious and merciful. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Faith purifies us, purifying their hearts by faith. When the Son of Man cometh, shall he find personal faith, persevering faith, purifying faith on the earth? We're looking at uh, this section on the three perspectives. Number one, conditional faith for reaching uh, the end time harvest. Number two, consecrating faith 
in reaping the end time harvest. Number three, careless, faithlessness, ruining the end time harvesters. You see, there are harvesters, they become hypocrites and allow themselves to be ruined by careless faithlessness. Look at number one. Number one is conditional faith for reaping the end time harvest. Matthew chapter 9. I'm reading from verse 35. In Matthew chapter 9, reading from verse 35, and Jesus went about all cities and villages teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. Understand what Jesus did? He healed, yes, but he didn't concentrate only on healing. Healing is good. It heals the body. But you know the body will go to the grave when we die. The spirit, the soul that will go back to God needs salvation, needs the grace of God, and needs the transformation. So if we just concentrate on healing, 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 all those people that were healed, if they are not saved, if they are not born again, if their lives do not turn around, if their names do not enter into the book of life, where will they spend eternity? Jesus balanced everything. Teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. Verse 36, in verse 36, but when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted and they were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. Sometimes as we're having this kind of crusade that we have GCK, the gospel for every creature, if you believe in the Lord, you repent, raise up your hand, you do, and then we tell them, you must turn away from sin and turn to the Savior, and they do, and they're born again, and they're saved. But the leadership in the church does not do any follow-up. All those uh, souls are just, they don't have any pastor. They don't have any shepherd. And they're just here and there. They're radio Christians. They're television Christians. They're media Christians. But they do not have any father, any mother. They're just like that. Their souls just scattered everywhere, having uh, no shepherd. They must have shepherd. We must follow up on them. We must bring them in to the full. Little flock, not just scattered sheep, little flock. It is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom, bring you into the kingdom. And so we must not allow the people to be like scattered sheep with no shepherd. Look at verse 37. In verse 37, then saith he unto his disciples, the harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Verse 38, pray ye therefore, the Lord of the harvest, the Lord of the harvest, that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. That's what he wants done. And when we pray that the Lord will send laborers to his harvest, we must pray in faith. James chapter 1, we're reading from verse 6. In James chapter 1 verse 6, but let him ask in faith. Let him pray in faith. Nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. We're coming back to Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10, he had told them at the end of chapter 9, pray. And they prayed. And God only answers the prayer of faith. 
Let him pray in faith, nothing will bring. And they are praying. Look at the result. Matthew chapter 10, verse 1. When he had called unto him the 12 disciples, he gave them power against unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. When you are praying in faith for the Lord to send harvesters, reapers into the harvest field, you must be willing to be an answer to the prayer. It's not like send them. How about you? Send me. Send us. And we want the Lord to send laborers into his harvest. And I'm available so that I can be one of those people that he was sent. As he told them to pray, and they prayed, and they prayed in faith. Now he called them, he said, you will be the first partaker. You'll be the first answer. You'll be the first solution to the prayer you have prayed. And he called those 12 disciples, and he gave them power. He gave some clean spirits to cast them out and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. Look at verse 7. In verse 7 it says, And as she go, preach. As she go, he gives us the power to heal. And we don't just go for healing and healing and healing. Demonstration. Manifest is said, yes, you have the power. The power is to back up the message. He says, as you go, don't be carried away. And you know, that miracle has happened. That lame is walking. The blind is seen. And then uh, you are carried away. He said, no, no. That's you have that authority, you have that anointing, but as she go preach, saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. We're looking at verse 8 there. In verse 8, heal the sick, preach first. Cleanse the lepers, preach first. Raise the dead, preach first. Cast out devils, preach first. Freely ye have received, freely give. You have received, you will give in Jesus' name. Amen. Look at verse 16. In verse 16 it says, Behold, I send you forth a sheep in the midst of wolves. It's saying when you go and you're preaching, I'm sending you forth a sheep, but the wolves are there. Don't come back because of the wolves. Don't stay back because of the wolves. Don't run away. Don't flee because of the wolves. He told us already. He said he's sending us forth a sheep in the midst of wolves. And don't waste your life. Don't waste your calling by fighting the wolves. And then uh -uh, they're like that. They're wolf in their hearts and they're wolf in their action. Okay. I too, if you can do that bad thing, I too, I can. And then you begin now a ministry of retaliation, a ministry of fighting back. You forgot your calling. He said, as she go, preach. The wolves will be there. The adversaries will be there. Don't get their nature and don't get their action and don't begin. A ministry has not given you fighting the wolves. They are there, but they will not hurt you. It says, be ye therefore wise as serpents and harmless as those. We're well, looking at Luke chapter 10. In Luke chapter 10, reading from verse 1, after these things, after he had sent the twelve, he still saw that the harvest is plenteous and the laborers only twelve, they are few. He will still send more. After these things, the Lord appointed the other seventy also and sent them two and two before his face into every city and place whither he himself will come. Now he has uh, many people and he has seventy. He did not abdicate 
because there are now assistants. He did not have to create his own calling. He came in the world to the world to save sinners. And now he sent out 12. He sent, he's sending out 70. He didn't say, now I can't forget about it. Because many people are there already. We don't abdicate. We don't stop. What we are called to do just because we are raising up other leaders, we are raising up other evangelists, we are raising up other soul winners. He sent them into every city and place whither he himself would come. He was still doing it while all those people he sent out were doing it. And he did it well and you will do it well. Look at verse 17. In verse 17, it says, And the 70 returned again with joy, saying, Lord, even the devils, that word even means sicknesses bowed, diseases bowed, all opposing powers bowed, even the devils were subject unto us, are subject unto us through thy name. In verse 18, and he said unto them, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. Verse 19, I told you, before you go out in the morning, go to this verse. And before you go to the evangelistic field, go to this verse. And when you've done your quiet time, the bush, go to this verse. And before you sleep at night, go to this verse. You remember? I don't want to ask you to do it. Don't worry. You will do it. Amen. Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Amen. Amen. Verse 20. In verse 20, notwithstanding, in this rejoice not that the spirits are subject unto you, but 